for what it's worth, we look back on those kinds of things and go, whoa, did we? I mean, at the time, you didn't think too much about it, but as time passes and some of the filter that you had built in being in those situations goes away, and all of a sudden, wow, did, did we really do that? I mean, it hardly seems, it hardly seems possible sometimes. On one hand, you know you did. On the other hand, you go, really? It's, 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 almost, like, it's almost like it's another universe for you. My name is Dave Bristol. I was born in Grand Junction and I was raised in, uh, in Fruta, Colorado. I don't know that I can recall the first time I heard about the war. Um, I remember I remember pretty early on there was a, a young man in our community who was killed in Vietnam. That was the first time I ever really heard of anybody being killed. Um, his grandmother lived up the road from us. That young man was the first of three from Fruta that I know of that were killed. I think probably the later two may have caused a little more awareness in the community because the later two were both far better known, I think. Uh, both families were pretty well known in the community. I remember seeing pictures in one of the yearbooks in, in high school, and I don't know if it was mine or, or an earlier one, but it was a picture of aircraft on an aircraft carrier, and the headings had to do with that. So it, it was kind of a, it was a vague awareness it was, wasn't called Vietnam probably when I was studying geography or whatever in, in classes. I don't remember if we talked about it or not. French Indochina was the, the term that was commonly used because that's what it was before, during, and after World War II. I think I was always at least aware of serving uh, my dad was in the South Pacific during World War II, and so I knew something of that. My uncle was there as well. So yeah, it was always not something that I really planned for, but it was not something that I ever just rejected out of hand either. I think I probably chose the Army for a couple of reasons. One, my dad had been in the Army. The, the other reason for choosing the Army was somewhere along the line he decided that I wanted to fly. And the only place you could fly without a college uh, degree uh, was with the Army, and it was flying helicopters. So that probably was the major influence. I didn't want to get drafted because my mom had talked about it a little bit, that you know she wasn't real thrilled, as I'm sure most moms weren't, about me being in the infantry. My path to the infantry basically started when I f washed out of flight school. At that point, you were in the Army. The Army had said, okay, we did what we said we were gonna do. And so that meant you were going to the infantry. But I ended up in advanced infantry training at Fort Gordon, Georgia, which was a whole story in and of itself. During that period of time then, I was offered the opportunity to attend NCO school. And while I was in NCO school, the Ranger thing became a bigger deal because that was during the time when the Ranger Regiment was being established. I had always wanted to be good at something and I always felt like I really wasn't necessarily. When I got into the infantry, some of that stuff clicked for me and then Ranger school became a, okay, maybe I really could be a little arrogant maybe, but <laughs> that was that was kind of what pushed me that way. The other motivation for many of us was, you know, hey, we're going to Nam. We might as well go as well trained as we can possibly be. Ranger School is designed to be, it's a leadership school, but they, they use sleep deprivation, food deprivation, and the physical load as a stressor and so that you're under stress all the time. And the idea is we've taught you these leadership and these tactics, can you do them under fairly severe uh, duress? The mountain phase was extremely helpful when I got to Vietnam because as close as you could approximate the terrain of the Central Highlands was probably uh, at Camp Merrill. 
in North Georgia. I think probably the biggest thing for me was the ability to understand the changes in how navigation happened when you're working in steep terrain that goes up and down where you can't operate in a straight line, you can't just count steps and know how far you've gone, and you learned a little bit about the difficulties of trying to keep track of where you were when you couldn't see very far. The other thing that was taught was you learned to triangulate when you could see. <laughs> you would find a spot where you could see something and use your compass and map to work backwards from a from a, a known position or a mountain or whatever. And so I think that was the biggest thing was the ability to navigate. The other thing was to learn what the limits were on how far you could move. The idea that you would walk 2,000, 3,000 meters with those kinds of loads in that kind of terrain, um, I mean, it was, it was very difficult and um, that carried over into what we did in the Highlands. There was something about Rick Williams. Before I even got to know him, he just kind of projected a competence. Confidence, yes, but competence was what really showed through with him. Rick was a real quiet guy. He was a little bit older than most of us. He was, uh, he was a college graduate. He was very, very good at teaching the skills and the things that you needed to do to be a successful team leader um, in, our, in our unit. You got the idea that he was a guy who was doing what he needed to do. He wasn't gonna be a soldier. He wasn't going to stay there, um, and it, that is borne out by what happened afterwards. None of us have ever seen him or heard of him from him again. And he's a bright guy. He was college educated. I can't imagine that he doesn't have awareness of the Internet, and none of us can ever. Mike Browning has looked for him. Uh, Mike and he were very close, and he, I think what he did was I did my thing. It's over. I would guess that 90% of the people that know him don't know he was even in Nam, let alone in a ranger unit. But he was, he, was, um, he was extremely efficient and thorough. I think that was one of the things that Rick taught us was that attention to detail. Probably the best example is that he had a checklist, and I think it was basically a yellow legal pad, and it had two lists down the front and, and the backside was covered too and you do this 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 and he checked that list very much like a professional pilot would go through a pre-flight checklist he was the one that taught me to everybody pack every ruck the same way all the time so that if if you had your first aid equipment in the right hand upper pouch on your pack that's where they were all the time. The idea was that if somebody got hurt or somebody went down and you didn't have yours, you knew where to look with somebody else's. The claymores were always packed the same way. Water and food was always packed the same way. It was always done the same way. So if something happened, you could find it. It also helped at night if you had to try to find something in the dark and you <laughs> you didn't want to be making a whole lot of noise, but um, you could you could find that stuff. The other thing that I think was critically important with him was he somehow could convey to us the importance of taking care of your guys, but also completing the mission. Because the line units and the other combat units depended on the information that we gave. And he understood the importance of that. He was able to teach that balance between the risk that you were taking with yourself and your guys and the necessity to find out what was really there. If anybody has made contact with him, um, they haven't said so. It's possible that somebody has and he just asked them not to ever bring it up. But um, I think he just, he was a quiet, kind man. And I think he did that job I think he probably, I don't know this, but I think he probably felt a duty to do what he could do. But when it was over, it was over. I was assigned to K Company 
75th Infantry, which was the Ranger Regiment, we were operationally controlled by assigned to the 4th Infantry Division in the highlands of Vietnam, and we worked directly with the 1st of the 10th Cav. The word LERP is kind of a weird word. The Army does that with stuff. It's pronounced L-U-R-P, but what it really stands for is Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. And, and I mean, that basically describes the mission right there. It's long range. We were oftentimes anywhere from 15 to 60 kilometers away from any other American unit, oftentimes out of range of artillery support. Helicopters could get there, but it could take a while. So we were we were out away uh, quite a bit. Reconnaissance, primarily our mission was to get in, find out what was there. If we saw units, we would make fairly meticulous notes about how they were, uh, how they were armed, how they were behaving, how they, uh, where they might be uh, staying, uh, bunker complexes, trails, anything that might have been of any importance to a larger infantry unit that might be required to go in and work in that area. So that's why we took it fairly seriously because if you didn't find something uh, or chose not to go to an area just because it was difficult, that could be the piece of information that they needed to, to not have casualties. And that was, that was what Rick taught us uh, very much. I mean, that when it wasn't Rick, that was ingrained throughout the whole command. Uh, that's part of the Ranger creed, actually. You know, you don't lie to other soldiers and officers because the information you have is life and death or can be to them. So that was that was kind of what we did. Rick Williams told me, he said, your job is to get in, find out what's there, get out without anybody ever knowing you were there. And the idea was that if you were compromised, number one, you were, you were in significant danger uh, because you got four guys and that's not enough to carry on a battle. And I. As a team leader, I really never, I never fought very much. My weapon was the radio, and I was with artillery if we had it. I was talking to gunships if we could get them. The assistant team leader was taking care of the navigational bit to try to get to wherever we needed to be. So that was a big deal. But the Vietnamese, Viet Cong, and the North Vietnamese were masters. Once they knew they had been discovered, they disappeared. And so anything that you had basically come up with for them was now at least suspect. If you're discovered, you have removed any kind of surprise that, a, that an American unit might have. The whole purpose of, of LERP units, from the predecessor units, the, the LRP, Long Range Patrols, and, and some of the provisional units that were there, was they needed American intelligence on the ground, and at that point there weren't units in the, in the military that were capable of doing that. There were recon units, but they worked in much, much larger units. They were find and fix. The weapons that we carried most of the time in four-man units were M16s. Uh, some of the team leaders carried CAR 15s, which were a shortened folding stock uh, version of the M16. It looks a lot like the modern M4. We rarely carried machine guns because they were so heavy. Um, usually if you carried a machine gun you had a fifth guy uh, because you had to spread the load. Basic load of ammunition for most of us was probably in the neighborhood of 600 rounds of, of ammunition for the M16s. We carried fragmentation grenades, uh, we car everybody carried a couple, I don't remember exactly how many. Everybody carried a smoke grenade. Uh, usually carried a couple of white phosphorus grenades because they had uh, some functionality in breaking contact. Everybody carried a claymore mine, which was the anti-personnel mine. We used those for defensive purposes at night. They were handy if you got chased. You could set one down and, and it would uh, discourage people from chasing you, for, at least for a little while. Maps, first aid equipment, compasses. Most guys carried some sort of a knife, um, food and water. We carried water for five days, especially in the, in the hot season. Dehydration was a given. You can't carry that much water. I mean, by the time we got water and everything in, packs were 85, 80 to 85 pounds most of the time. 
So a lot of us didn't carry a lot of food. I only ate twice a day because I couldn't. I was, I was load limited. <laughs> now some of the bigger guys like my point man later on, Dave Siglow, they had to carry more stuff because they simply couldn't, they simply couldn't deal with, he used more water than the smaller guys did. And he was my point man, so he was working harder than I was. The running the gun line mission was, there were a couple things about it that uh, are memorable. Number one, w that was not a long range patrol. We were not far from on K. We were doing road security. QL-19, the, the regional highway, ran from the coast clear to Pleiku and through on K. And there was a pipeline that was above ground and of course it was a target rich environment for the for the Vietnamese. Most of the time they were Viet Cong and they would blow up bridges and they would plant mines and, and they would blow up the pipeline. There was a pump station there. So there was a fair number of missions where we you know, pulled missions in that area to se help secure the road. In this case, we were operating in an area which was uh, much more open than we, than we liked. Sometime during that period of time, we came around uh, from, we were moving from one bush to another, basically, and we came around a small clump of bushes and just walked right into uh, a group of what, at the time, I thought were probably Viet Cong. Two of the guys were facing away from us. The other guy was facing toward us, and they had a cooking fire and a little and a little hooch, and they were preparing a meal. Bob White was walking point for me at the time. He saw them, he stopped us, and in his mind, the best thing to do was to try to back out of that um, so that we didn't get discovered, um, which was a good idea. Unfortunately, the guy that was facing us saw us, and that triggered Bob had no choice. He reached for his weapon, so Bob had no choice. But our first reaction in any kind of a contact was to break contact. And so we moved back away and found some area where we could hide. Um, I was on the radio, and then it became apparent that there were way more than those three guys. And that were far and away the most aggressive group of soldiers I ever dealt with until well later. And they came after us. I think they must have known what we were and they came after us. And so because we were close to the road and LZ Schuler was the fire base that had our fire support, one of the first things I noticed was that I could go in a straight line from where I was to LZ Schuler. And Rick had talked about this. He said, it won't happen very often, but if you, if you are on the gun line from Schuler or wherever your guns are to wherever you're shooting, you can just travel that gun line and you don't have to adjust your artillery left and right. All you have to do is add and drop. And since they were after us, and right then that was the only way I could really use anything to help keep them off of us. I just gave Bob the heading. I said, stay as close to that as you can. And what we would do is we would drop some rounds behind us and some rounds in front of us. As we moved, you would just walk the artillery back. They were 105s. Had they been anything but 105s, probably couldn't have done that. Uh, anything else would have been too big. And certainly something like 175s would have been that would have been suicidal because they're notoriously inaccurate. In the highlands, the flora and fauna, the plant and the forest and all of that varied greatly. On the Mangyang Pass, a little bit north and west of, of Anke, there were huge open areas covered with um, elephant grass. You know, they were big. And then as you got into the little into the valleys and stuff, then you would get into extremely thick stuff, anywhere from triple canopy jungle to double canopy jungle. And triple canopy was really, in some ways, easier to navigate in because you could see a little bit on the ground. It didn't have as much brush and stuff growing because it didn't get enough light. Problem there was everybody else could see you too. And then there was virtually no way you could see out of it. So navigation became I mean, it was dead reckoning, and you kind of had to just figure out how far you thought you'd gone, and does that match what you're seeing right here? Does that match what you see on your map? In the double canopy, then the brush and stuff underneath was wicked. It, it, some places, uh, bamboo would grow in those places. It was so thick, you couldn't walk through it. Vines 
the wait a minute vines were notorious and they'd, you know, big stickers on them and they'd hook you and while you were undoing one, two more would, would get you. Even vines on the ground sometimes, you know, were trip you and get your foot caught in there. So there was a lot of variation in the highlands about that. But when people talk about being in the jungle, we were in the jungle, but that could be extremely uh, variable. Elephant grass could be anywhere from two or three feet high to, to maybe 12 or 13 feet high. It, it was just extremely variable uh, as to what we had. Each one of them posed their own problems and risks and in some cases benefits. I much preferred working in double canopy because it was a lot easier to conceal yourself. The wildlife there, it was was pretty amazing in, in, in a lot of ways. I think probably the first thing you say is pretty much everything that you saw there was bigger than what you saw in the mountains of Colorado. Centipedes, you know, eight, eight or nine inches long, and millipedes that were maybe twice that long. The picture that's in the book was actually Captain Ruben Cyberling issued a challenge to his teams to see who could bring in the biggest snake. This was well before my time, but that's that was the winner of that. Uh, and I put that in just because it's kind of a, a wink and a nod at, at Captain Cyberling because he looks back at that and he wonders why in the world he was distracting his LERP teams <laughs> to go chasing snakes. But there were lots of animals there. I saw two snakes while I was there, so it wasn't a big, for me, it wasn't a big deal. I don't like snakes. And the fact that I didn't see them and I didn't get real close to either one of them was fine with me. The things that bothered us the most were leeches land leeches and even where you weren't on water under uh, under the leaves and the duff there if it was wet it was full of land leeches and they would get all over you you kind of got to the point where you didn't like them on you and you you know put bug juice on them and kill them and get them off of you but it was not like you were going to keep them off of you and that was the thing about they said woe to anybody that tore clothing because then they were going to get you could blouse your boots and you know, keep everything tied down real tight and that helped uh, but you couldn't cover up everything so they were they were nasty there were deer in that area i saw one little one one time i saw two of the bigger ones but they were on their way to a barbecue somewhere on the, on the skids of a on the skids of a huey there were tigers in the central highlands and um, I never had any real close encounters. We had one that walked around our night location a couple of times once. Uh, but there was a guy in the early, before it was K Company, in one of the brigade lerps that was killed by a tiger. I don't know if he was on guard or if he was asleep, uh, but it was in a night location and the tiger grabbed him and drug him off. But once you smelled one of them, you knew if they were around, you knew it. They, they stunk to high heaven. But the one that walked around us made an, an old, wet, cheap dog smell pretty good. <laughs> it was one of the fears that we had was being seen by American troops or American aircraft and mistaking us for a VC party. There were a couple of reasons for that. One is we operated in small units, which was parallel to what the VC typically did. We wore camouflage units, which from a distance essentially appeared just to be dark. And the VC frequently did not wear helmets or anything like that. We wore flop hats um, or sometimes berets, but we didn't wear any protective headgear or anything that would distinguish us. So from a distance, from an altitude, it was easy to look at a LERP team and think maybe that it was uh, a Vietnamese, uh, particularly Viet Cong. Um, and that did in fact happen to me one time. We had to travel across a big open area on top of the Mang Yang Pass and the grass was not you know, the 12 to 14 foot stuff, it was about waist deep. We couldn't move real quick because you didn't want to run into something, but you didn't want to mess around out there too long because of exactly what happened. And a, um, I think in this case, it was a slick, not a, not a gunship, but they still had two M60 machine guns, but it was enough to deal with four guys on the ground. They flew past us, they saw us, and they made a real quick turnaround and they were looking at us. And so what we did was we tried to do the most un Viet Cong thing we could do. One of us had a, a signaling mirror 
And so he was using that to flash to them. And then we had a signal panel, which was essentially a blaze orange piece of cloth. And I was just snapping it and opening it. And we just stopped. We didn't move, we didn't run, we didn't do anything. And they made a couple of turns. I would, got on the radio and, and I think probably they figured out what we were about the same time that they got a message back through their communication that they might be uh, circling an American unit. We didn't operate close to large American units for exactly that reason, because those guys did like pretty much everybody else did. They would shoot first and ask questions later. So we, we typically operated away from them because of that. Nighttime was in the highlands, especially if there was any cloud cover. You had one sense that you could use to determine if anybody was messing with you, and it was your hearing. And so we're all sitting there and we're just listening for everything and all of a sudden, boom, this jet goes right over the top of us. And I don't know that anybody slept for maybe three days because the adrenaline was... <laughs> we, we, were, we were in a contact and we had to run across a fairly substantial open area to get to an LZ. And the first two guys made it across and I don't remember if they got if they drew any fire or not, but Bob and I started off and I see these little puffs of dirt in front of Bob and I see Bob jumping the little puffs of dirt. And I, I just, I don't know, I just started, I didn't stop running, but I started laughing. Cause what he was doing was in his mind, there was something safer about, he was jumping bullets. And you know, we talked about it later and he got, it's the most ridiculous thing you ever saw in your life. But we jumped into the hole and I was laughing. He goes, what are you laughing? I said, you were jumping bullets. <laughs> No, you weren't, you were jumping dirt. <laughs> the pilots that worked with us were absolutely amazing. I didn't know it at the time, but I know now, they were all volunteers as well. They didn't have to take LERP missions. One that I wrote a little bit about was uh, a guy called Mooney, and he did a lot of uh, our visual reconnaissance flights, and he flew the Hughes 500 Loach. It was a flying egg, if you... All you have to do is imagine an egg with a tail on one end and a rotor on top, and that's exactly what it looked like. He was very good at what he did. He was kind of a character, and he would take two or three teams at a time, team leaders at a time, and we would do our VRs. And I think he felt like he should have been a fighter pilot, maybe. And uh, he was always wanting to throw frags out of the helicopter or something like that. So he'd say, here, take the aircraft. and. We'd go into the dive and he'd be throwing stuff out. One of the times he did that and the guy in the back seat didn't have his map and everything held down and his map just floated out the door and that caused a, a fair amount of consternation. He was memorable in the sense that he was such a character, but the guys that flew the slicks were the guys that we had the closest relationship with. Animal, and he earned his nickname and we'll just let it go at that. <laughs> He might have been the very best that we ever flew with. He would come and get you anytime, anywhere, um, and they all would, but he was much more aggressive than, than some of the other ones. There was uh, a guy who I'm friends with now, his first name is Dave. He didn't really have a nickname. He was, he was really, really good. He was another one of those kind of quiet guys that he just did his job. and was a guy that we called Spider-Man, and he was uh, very good. He was a little bitty guy. They would do whatever they could to try to get us into an LZ as quickly as possible. They would put the helicopters on the ground when a lot of other units complained about having to jump. Uh, these guys would put the helicopter on the ground. That wasn't very long, just long enough for you to get off and step off without jumping, but they would go clear down. and. Extractions, hot extractions with those guys. I mean, they're setting three feet off the ground with virtually no protection. And they would put that on the ground so you could get on and, uh, and have nothing but the utmost respect for uh, the pilots and the gun crews. The door gunners were lifesavers, especially on hot extractions because they provided almost all of the cover that you had. The gunships, we didn't have that close a relationship with. We knew them by call sign. But gunships always responded whoever was closest, so we didn't have that uh, closeness with them. But they did the same thing. They did stuff with the Cobras that was unbelievable. Oftentimes, the mere presence of a Cobra was enough to break a contact. They could put stuff as close as you wanted it and be reasonably safe about it.